Hey guys, how are you doing? If you've been keeping up with my channel, you've seen us do um, one of the worst arch tops I had ever run across. Most structural deficits. The only thing redeeming about it was the headstock. You're going to see that one in a minute. And then we've taken the path of building step-by-step -step numerous episode kit guitars. Now, those of you that have been with me for quite a while know that I started off building cigar box guitars like this one for example was built for Margaret Garrett of Mr. Airplane Man um, I happened to get this one back and sent another one her way I have been very fortunate uh, to have a number of artists everywhere worldwide um, take up getting a hold of one of my guitars and playing it uh, regularly. So uh, just this week I was seeing stuff coming up out of North Mississippi and into Europe and stuff like that. In fact, I just sent uh, an arch top single cutaway off to Ireland. So I've been very fortunate. Um, so my channel has been rewarding to me in a couple of different ways. I have been able to progress in what people call luthier skills, right? Luthier, what a word. Um, that can mean anybody that thinks they can change a set of strings to people who build really, really high end arch tops and things. So I never consider myself a luthier. That's why I have the email address. And if you ever try to get it, Lockdown. I have the fake luthier.com <laughs> hooked up. Sorry, guys. Anyway, you've seen me progress off into, like I said, arch tops that are just the worst. You know, this one, it's the Galliano junk pile. It was fighting back at me all the time. I finally had something that will play and quit moving around enough to, like, stay in tune and, and do what it does. And to be honest with you, I probably have a hundred hours into this guitar. So if you were to find a luthier, and unless you are extraordinarily rich and foolish, you would not take a guitar like this unless it was a family heirloom and put it in the hands of someone and say, here, spend a hundred dollars at fifty dollars an hour into this guitar. That just doesn't make sense. But the payoff for me whether we started with this kind of stuff. I remember when my action was really high, the stuff was unplayable. I got better and better at it. Um, hey, thank you, Darren Dukes. And I also want to tell you, if you're doing that cigar box guitar kind of stuff, find out who uh, MGB guitar parts are. Michael over there has been a, a, a real um, supporter of me along the way in the background by giving me parts uh, supply me with parts that are good and okay but so if you're going to do what I've done and apparently some of you uh, a little bit more than 5,000 of you watch my channel I think part of this is finding something fixing it up restoring it do whatever doing whatever you do uh, but there's kind of an end game to this when you start working through guitars and I hope that end game is not I'm going to pick up some cheap guitar, not cheap, but kind of by bamboozling somebody into getting rid of someone or something at a really good price and then turning around and finding somebody who doesn't know what's going on. Now, I, I did a couple of episodes about the, basically the honest truth about these cheap catalog arch tops, and I'll give you a link to that playlist up there, but here's the end game. If you get into a, a spot where you're just buying guitars and you're not getting rid of them, um, go see what your <laughs> diagnosis is. But at some point, if you've got some philanthropic issue and you're helping somebody and you're donating things to schools and stuff, that's, that's a good thing. But hopefully, there's something in it for you at the end. And the in it for me at the end is I like to be able to do what I do to guitars, increase their value, 
and maybe, I don't know, trade them off or whatever and gain a little equity along the way. And in that process, you will find that you will run across through a couple of trades, guitars that I'm calling too good to junk pile. And you're gonna meet one, yeah, it's a person. You're gonna meet one here in a minute. Now, I will tell you this. The minute you take, say, an arch top, an American-made arch top um, from the 30s or 40s, and we're talking something pretty high end, what you have to understand is the minute you start changing binding, the minute you start changing tuners, uh, tail pieces, drilling holes and things, the value of those things starts to go down. And the value is set by what the buyer will give the seller. So when you run across something, number one, if you're a buyer, you kind of want to look at it and go, is there, have there been significant changes made to this guitar? Have the pickups been changed out, by the way? That's a good thing to worry about because sometimes you'll find people that will take the original pickups out, change them out for something that looks like the original ones and they're pedaling the dog ear pickups and stuff like that for high dollars. Same thing with tuners and the like. But look at a guitar and figure out, has somebody taken the meat off the bone? Meaning if I keep this guitar for a while and sell it, will be there anything left or do I have a wall full of guitars that have been someone's experiment? Now, I have learned a great deal the hard way. I'm one of those stubborn people that will not get on internet and say, okay, how do I do this? A lot of the stuff that you see me telling you is stuff that I've kind of figured out myself. And so therefore, in my work world, you'll hear people say, what are other agencies doing? What are other cities doing? Uh, it's like, wait a minute, who cares what they're doing? I'm doing what I'm doing and I'm certainly not a copier, and sometimes me being a trailblazer takes you to a dead-end wall at 80 miles an hour, but that all comes with the territory. I am going to show you a guitar today that um, I basically traded several guitars uh, for. I feel pretty good about me being able to trade those. I got guitars, I put good work into them. Everybody was happy with their deals, uh, but I do have a few guitars that I keep in the back. Remember, I don't play, I plunk around or whatever. But at the end of the day, if I can find myself a rusty old 1930s National with a cone in it, and I can find a Gibson uh, late 30s, early 40s model, arch top, um, acoustic, if that's what I end up with at the end of the day in that little area I never talk about, then I'm happy doing this and gaining experience and stuff along the way. So let's take a look at this guitar I'm talking about. It's another one of those that's too good to junk pile. Okay, meet a 1954 Gretsch Electromatic. Now, this guitar is in good shape. Um, the tuners are fine. Um, as you saw, the headstock is beautiful. There's not a bunch of scratches on it. The neck is in great shape. I like this neck profile. It's beefy. It doesn't come to a point. The fretboard looks good. It's a little bit dried out, but it doesn't show signs of the fret sticking out. So uh, hot and cold heat shrinking and things like that. There's nothing wrong with where the fingerboard meets the body. It has the original pickup. Now, Gretsch started putting electronics on their guitars in 1939. So the Electromatic came out in 1939. This is a 1954. Um, the serial numbers inside the body, there's pretty good information on the Gretsch website, which by the way, Gretsch currently is a Fender product, but what started off in the last quarter of the um, 17th century, is that the 18th century, 19th century, whatever, 1870 something, there was a German immigrant that, that um, started the Gretsch company. Again, model numbers, 
this is in the 10,000 series. I'll try to give you a clip of the label that's in there so you can see it. But this dates to 1954. Now, it's got everything original on it. The original bridge is here. It's kind of interesting, and I'll show you when we get a close-up what that looks like. The knobs are here. That's incredible. The original wiring harness, but the only problem is the tail piece broke off. You see that little piece of blue tape on the end there? I'm going to talk to you about that and what it means. But the finish on this guitar is pretty much immaculate. There's a couple of spots here that we're going to work on. We're going to take this thing to the bench and we're going to go through it and, and run the camera up and down. And I'm going to talk about the very few things that I have to do to this guitar. And if I have to change anything, I'm going to make sure it's reversible. So that said, let's do some work, some very practical work on a guitar that is too good to junk pile. And through that process, I'm going to show you a couple little tricks and a couple little handy tools that I think you'll want in your toolbox. So that said, let's get to the bench and have a closer look. All right, first off, I want to tell you, I really love the Stumac um, workstation. You wouldn't like it if you saw what was going on behind the scenes over there, but not to worry. It's my guitar. Anyway, I did an episode about this. You'll get a link to it right up there right about now about what this workstation will do. It spins around. It does what it needs to do. But once you're set up to do your work, it's got all kinds of holes for your tools and reamers and magnetic strips again pay attention when you're set up that we're spinning this thing around I even got a little vise up here I don't know if you can see it right there uh, for working on nuts and things like that but let's get to this guitar first off the headstock logo on it is exquisite it's still got the paint here around it um, nothing's chipped out nothing is scratched it has um, the tuners on it thread in that's kind of interesting for the time um, the tuners are in great shape the fingerboard could use a little bit of hydration but it's been kept in an environment where there uh, is nothing sticking out so there hasn't been a lot of uh, uh, hot and cold to make things shrink and and then swell back up and want to crack Everything here is in good shape. The nut is in good shape. It is radiused. Let's turn this thing over without it crashing to the floor. Let's get this. This Mr. Power neck holder is a good thing uh, for setting up props, especially if you're filming like this. Now, when we look close here, there's some checking going on, meaning... The finish is cracking a little bit, but there's nothing chipped out of here. And I'm not seeing where there has been some um, uh, tuner change outs. There's a little bit of uh, rust and things like that and, and settling in. While we're here, you're not going to see this angle again. We want to make sure that those are tight and that we turn these in. Did you see how easily that one turned? Yeah, they need to be tightened up a little bit, so we'll do that while we are here. I've got a little bottle of Marvel Mystery Oil that I'm going to use and put a couple drops on there, and then we're going to make sure that all of these are in the right spot. Now, I will tell you this, if you do have to change the tuners on something like this and you start drilling... If you end up drilling in a line here, you'll notice that these tuners aren't really parallel to each other, meaning we wouldn't drill the holes in the exact same place because when you drill here and here and here and here, you're going to favor splitting, and I don't know whether or not this radius had anything to do in the design of that. But I will tell you this. If you do have to repair tuners or change tuners out, um, the holes that are there... Take a toothpick, um, break the end off, sand it down. You'll notice that I always have some kind of sandpaper here. Just do this, stick it in the hole, break it off, 
file it down. Now, I want to let you in on a tip. It's a trade secret, but I use bacon flavored toothpicks and only bacon flavored toothpicks. Now, lately there has been some supply chain issue with bacon flavored toothpicks. So let me let let me tell you, don't get shut down with other people controlling your supply. You see this? This is called bacon. You put this in your mouth, you chew it up, you get a few of these, you put them in your mouth, you let the bacon saliva soak in, you put them back in here, and voila, you've got your own supply of bacon flavored toothpicks. Would you care to try one? Anyway, there's a little bit of checking here. You can see that, but again, nothing wrong. Everything is good. We'll just lubricate these and make sure everything's tight. Moving down the neck a ways. There we go. No scratches, no indentations. Nothing looks like it's been dropped. And now, let's get to this spot right here. I'm having to balance this, so we're not going to be too long. There is nothing going on here. The binding was split right here, meaning the end piece come around here and here. I always look for things going on with the binding right here. Are there cracks here? Are there oddities here? Because the head block is underneath here and if it starts twisting and breaking loose from one side of the body or the other, that is gonna change the neck angle markedly so I don't see any separation uh, of the neck from the body here now the one thing that I do see that I'm not sure you'll be able to see from here is if I take my finger and go along to the binding the binding looks good here there's a slight discoloration right here and especially on the top side where I would almost bet get and also I can feel right here, if you run your finger down here, this binding is a tad shy. I have a gut feeling that this binding has been replaced at one time because in the factory, the binding that went on here would have been sticking out a little bit. It certainly wouldn't have been sunk in and someone would have come along and scraped it. So I think the binding on this guitar may have been redone. I don't know that that's a bad thing considering the binding that they used to use, but as we go down the rest of the back of the guitar, it is immaculate. There's really no buckle rash. You like that? How do you like all those ring lights above me that you didn't know were there? But the back of this is good. Let's flip it over here. We've got the same thing going on. There's a little bump right there. We're going to talk a little bit about that input jack, but flipping it over, again, everything looks pretty good. Let's get this thing set up to look at it this way. Okay, let's have a look at the neck area now. Turn it on its side here. Something interesting right there. Do you see there's two holes right here? which is almost indicative of something that we've seen before. Let me grab something here. And that would be one of these neck mount pickups. You see that, how it mounts into the side with two screws into the side of the fingerboard or the bracket, the board that's underneath the fingerboard, but when we turn it over, there's no screw holes there, nor evidence that there was anything there. Now the telltale sign is here, even though there's a hole for a pick guard mount right there. Do you see it? Right there. There's not one anywhere, either here or on the top. So, I think that has something to do with the original pick guard, which is missing from this guitar. Now, again, the fretboard could use a little bit of hydration, but 
there is nothing sticking out and you can tell the fret work on this thing is exquisite there's not fingernail marks or anything like that so someone has cared for this moving on let's take a look at the at the pickup um, when I first saw those holes over there on the side of the uh, uh, fingerboard I thought okay at one point maybe this had a different um, pickup that was mounted to the fingerboard which would make it not what it seems to be but that not being the case what I do see here is that there is some tarnishing going on in the poles of the pickup now I want you to notice that there are flat headed screws right here and you can turn those and you can see that the poles are coming up above the pickup just a little bit so what I'm going to do is I don't like to make anything different but this was obvious an ingenious design because it allowed you to put the individual poles up and down nearest the string now when I see this I don't want to do anything to this pickup but there is corrosion going on here I think these were sitting down a ways so I'm going to take some steel wool here quadruple aught old men say that and I am going to take a luthier magnet watch this and we're going to take the special rag that we have here and I am going to lay that luthier magnet right there and I'm going to take this steel wool and I'm going to go along the top of that hole there and you'll see that I'm taking the tarnish off of it and then check that out the steel wool fragments and whatever comes off of this jump right onto that magnet okay the next thing here is I told you that I see a little bit of discoloration along the edges let's move this that's the nice thing about this it pivots see a little bit of discoloration here and here and there seems to be a blemish right here so I'm wondering again there is a pronounced little lip right you hear that there's a little lip right here so I don't know whether this is the original binding and it has shrunk usually it would um, gas off or something like that but I'm not seeing any cracks anywhere which is a good sign it may have shrunk a little bit but everywhere you go there's a little lip, meaning that this binding is a little bit shallower than the channel there. So, my next concern is this right here. Now, I've told you guys that I'm a proponent of having magnets and lights and cameras and stuff. So, I've got this little, you can get this at most hardware stores. You can fit it within the F hole, you see, like that. What I'm trying to do here is get an angle on this that I can look through the F-hole and put a light in the other F-hole and see, is this a crack or something that's been uh, repaired in the past? So, I like this light. It is magnetic here. Um, that's the brand name. Look that up and it bends and it is very bright I can put this in the other F hole like so and point that up and then I can look in here and I see hide glue in here the binding on this thing is interesting or the kerfing I can see the original work and the, and the hide glue is a is oozed out a little bit but not too much and then as I look up I'm looking right at this area and there is nothing 
there so it's not a crack. I can see the tag very clearly. Let's have a look at that. So again, if you're going to go out looking at guitars, I've got um, cameras that plug into computers and phones and all that kind of thing. I have one of these that's lit. Always remember that you want something that is going to fit down into the F hole that you're able to turn. And some of those lit models uh, don't allow you to do that because they're too thick. But this thing is a must-have along with a light that has... A flexible neck this one is rechargeable you just pull this off of here and plug it in so you don't have to mess with batteries you could actually plug it into your car while you're out on your trip but now let's take a let's take a look at what we've got going on here there seems to be a couple of dull spots here there's a little bit of an impression here where it looked like it got crimped but it, whenever you see this hazing around the edges you want to know especially if it's around the neck or the fingerboard you want to know if something's been steamed off which would cause you to take a look at where the neck meets and then usually that joint would be right here so you'd be suspect to this fret being a little bit different i don't see any of that but let me show you a gadget here it's actually Meguiar's Scratch X Fine Scratch and Blemish Remover. So you want to make sure that you have wipe all rags are really good. We've talked about these WYPALL80. This is one. Or you just get pieces of these microcloths and you take a little bit of this stuff and you take it around. And put a couple spots on and you can go around and get rid of some of these blemishes so you just take your micro cloth make sure there's nothing on it that will scratch and you go around and just do a few little circles with this stuff you don't want to leave this stuff sit on there too long but wherever you see there's blemishes and things like that it actually wouldn't hurt you to do the the whole top this way now there's checking going on here. You can see it popping up here. And that's normal with a guitar that's, well, if this was made in 1954, you got, it's starting to get pretty old. Don't leave too much of that on there. And then you leave it dry off for a bit. And you just come in with your soft rag and come along. <laughs> And you can get rid of a lot of those blemishes like that. Again, don't leave it sit on there too long. What this is doing is it's actually taking whatever is there and, and actually it's the same as sanding it down with a fine pe piece of sandpaper, but that blemish that you saw is now gone. Bingo. Okay, let's pull this back around. Um, this work stand makes it where you can adjust this guitar to be about anything. But let's take this straight edge that we have now. This is one of the things you want to take a look at with any guitar before you even buy it because it will tell you everything you need to know about the neck and the action that goes with the neck. So you're going to take a straight edge. You're going to lay it on the frets. And you're going to see that you're going to desire to have... The top of the straight edge right, right at the top of the bridge. Um, since the straight edge is on the frets themselves, it doesn't account for the height of the nut, which is going to bring it up a little bit. And if this is right here, you can raise this up by turning these thumb screws and raise it up. If this is way up here, um, or it's down below here, you probably have a neck problem. And when you start speculating on buying these guitars to make some money off them, you won't. Also, I want you to notice we talked before about raising and lowering these poles. The straight edge will tell you, is that pole actually up too high? If it is, I can take and 
screw that down they actually counterclockwise lowers them and in fact I think I'll take all of these down to where they're flush with the top of the pickup and we'll settle any issues we have later when we get the strings on and start adjusting you'll hear buzzing or things wanting to be too close or too far from the strings one more to go this is the opposite of lefty loosey righty tighty turning counterclockwise lowers the pole taking it further away from the string all right the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the bridge where it went and where it's supposed to go because that's important for intonation so i'm glad somebody taped this on here of course you want to be very careful about what the tackiness of the adhesive tape you use is for this kind of stuff because you end up marring stuff up this is kind of funny this says rob on here because when this guitar came into the shop obviously somebody thought you know what rob is going to want that one that's our friend rob over at Guitar 48. That's where I got this guitar. Rob you was good enough to send it to me because he is knowing what's right up my alley. Now you can see right there that there is a mark where this has gone in the past. I also want you to notice this is kind of odd. I've not seen this before, but the posts for the thumb screws one of them is beveled out on this side. One is beveled out on that side. I've never seen that before. That's interesting. But you can tell that this part of the a bridge bevels down here, meaning th this part is where the smaller strings are, the treble strings and the bass strings are a bit thicker and bigger. So we're gonna take a piece of blue tape blue meaning base and we are going to put it on the base side of the bridge then I can set that aside by the way this bridge is irreplaceable it's one of those things that if you don't have it you'll wish you had now of course we're going to take our Marvel mystery oil while it's here and we can't forget to do this on the tuners too, but we're just going to put a couple little drops there and let that soak in. They were already starting to decay a little bit or, or corrode. And now remember, the higher point goes on the base side, and we'll just put that away. You do not want to lose this, so put it somewhere safe like up there okay so we've talked about in the past if you do have to replace the bridge you're going to want to put a piece of sandpaper here so you can sand the bridge down so there's not any gaps and stuff because if there are gaps underneath the bridge to the top of the arch top you're, you're certainly going to get a crack i think you can see that there is not a crack there, but that's the face where everything came together. Now, if I take my finger and put it in here, this is a tone bar guitar like some of them we've been working on. That's the configuration or the parallel bracing. And we're going to put a couple pieces of binding tape right along what's in line with the edge of the fingerboard there, one on each side. Now, we can see that this fingerboard or the bridge that was on there before was tilted a little bit to intonate it which is kind of normal but we want to check and make sure that it goes where it's supposed to so we're going to take this yardstick one is here numbers go bigger and we're going to put this at the end of the knot behind the knot and we're going to measure to the middle of the 12th fret which is right there so we put this here, and we make a mark right in the middle of the 12th fret. And I've put a G on this for 
Gretsch because you can tell I've used this to do numerous other ones. And now we're going to go from the center of the 12th fret, like so, and we're going to make a mark right there. And, oh, we need to move that one way over. What was I thinking, right? We can just do it right there. So, you can tell that everything being straight, like so, would have put the bridge right there, but it is tilted a little bit for intonation. So, we want to know where that bridge is going to go. Finally, let's take off this tag to Rob. Hey, Rob, I appreciate you steering this kind of stuff my way. Stop in and see Rob. Guitar 48 and Venture. In fact, I'll give you a link to the shop and the site down below. Thanks, Rob. Okay, now we're going to get down to where we have to do some work finally. And I want you to notice that this belly board here slides a number of ways and up and down too. So we're going to get where the end of the guitar is in the scene like so and tighten up the neck and I want you to notice let's pull this around just a little bit I want you to notice these knobs these knobs are different and they're rare and here's why there's a slotted bolt that goes in here it's not a screw and we're going to do this very carefully because splitting these out is not a good thing. Um, we are going to put a piece of tape on here. And I'm going to put an F on this one because it's closest to the front. And I am going to put an R on this one because it's closest to the rear. That'll keep that that way. Again, when you're working on these, remember they are irreplaceable. Over tightening them will crack them. You are at the whim of the market when you need one of these. And here's why. You don't see any splines on here at all. Neither one of them. That's because this these bolts here tighten down flat against the shaft. Now, we want to make sure that we can reach in here like so. The original wiring harness is on here. So, I really don't feel like taking it apart, especially since we have determined that everything works. That's what's nice about Rob. He's going to tell you if something works and if something doesn't. Okay, while I'm here, it's been a really long time, probably since 1954 that these were put on here. In the event I ever have to take them off, I want them to work. So I know I'll just put some Marvel Mystery on. No, we don't want to do that. What I want to do is I want to take a piece of paper towel. I want to make a little V out of it like this. You see that? And then I'm going to put my Marvel Mystery Oil on it over here. And then I'm just going to take it and put it where everything comes together like so. And get a little bit of oil right where those threads meet everything. It's going to take me a couple times to do that. Once that's done, I don't want this Marvel Mystery Oil on the finish, but... It's going to put a little bit of oil there and keep those threads workable. Now, I'm going to take my finger and put it on here and touch the potentiometer in there. And I'm going to take the side, the lefty-loosey, righty-tighty side. So the right is where the teeth are, are tightening. I'm going to put that there. And see, it's already trying to spin. So had I not put some oil down in there, these threads are locking up already, and they're trying to spin the potentiometer. If you don't 
back this up with something and you spin this around, one of your wires will come off. So it's a good idea to lube up those potentiometers before you check and see if that nut is tight. Now there's a gap right there. It almost looks like there's a split ring on these. But if you want to take some contact cleaner and spray down in there and get, I think they call it a rheostat or something, inside the potentiometer, there are things that rotate over each other, plates like this. I have a handy, handy tool that I just got. Let me show you that now. Okay, guys, this is a tool that is a must-have if you're going to be working on any high-dollar or old American arch top. That can be an Econo arch top or a better one, and that is this little gadget. You see this? So it's got a hole right there. The top is open. There's threads. Now, watch this. You are not going to believe this. First thing you want to do is you want to make sure that when you're, like I said, working on these old potentiometers and they have knobs like this, you are at the whim of the market if you're looking for one of these. Now I want you to pay attention. There's a set screw and there are no splines here or here. And what happens is these potentiometers get gummed up because on the inside of them there are several surfaces that do this and do resistance or whatever somebody could tell you this uh, an electronics nerd but I want you to see that there is our threads here and there's a little lip right here this one almost looks like it has a split ring or something but there's a little gap right there now taking these in and out of here is a terrible thing and while we're in here we want to make sure that we take our spanner wrench and put our finger in here like this where the knob is on and get a hold of the body. And then I told you about Marvel Mystery Oil and taking a piece of paper towel. Marvel Mystery Oil is the best. And wicking this a little bit so these don't get gummed up. You're not trying to take them off, but you certainly don't want them to freeze up. So you've got this spanner that's got teeth on one side here let's do this so you can hear it and not on the other and you flip it over and it's the same way so it's lefty loosey righty tighty if I want to tighten my teeth are going to be on the right so again I come in under here and just do that once I have the cap off but this cleaner this contact cleaner if I spray this on here, you don't know what it's going to do to the top, so you don't want to do that. But we are going to thread this thing on here. Now, this is available from Stu Mac. I don't know about anywhere else. That's where I got mine. But you just screw that on there where the threads are, like so. I'm going to back this off just a tad. That's not going to work out perfect for me. It would really be cool if it were completely tight because this top is open and when these sit down I would imagine you could also put a piece of rubber down in while we're here I know this is a long episode down in there and that would kind of seal it off but the idea is is this little hole here goes to the inside and since the threads are there I can take my contact cleaner and put this in here and limit the flow of the contact cleaner down into the pot right where that surface is. Okay, you see that? So, on a guitar like this, you don't want to be messing up the surface. So, you want to take your rags like so and get them ready I'll put this on here like so wrap everything around might be better to have two of them like so then you grab everything you put your finger over the top of this and you put your 
spray tube nozzle or whatever you want to call it down in there and just cover that up and give it a light little shot remember keep your thumb or finger over the top there you can wear gloves if you want just give it the tightest little shot there see that make sure everything vaporizes off it will it's like a solvent so it will vaporize off don't get any on your surface then unscrew this what I like to do is I like to make sure that everything is all the way down turn everything off and then when I put my if I can find my screwdriver that I had when I put this back on I'm going to put that set bolt to the back like that and then put it on like so and just turn it a few times and you will see that that pot will free right up if it doesn't you might as well replace it but this one has the original stuff so I'm gonna get this one done I think you saw how it was done Oh, I do want to show you a little something here. If you pay attention to details, if your knobs are turned all the way down or off, or down to the lowest tone here, lowest volume here, and you pull these off, if you look at the top, there's a detail there where there's a little wire there that comes around. It almost looks like a G. You see that? Okay, so the pots are working good now. I'm going to scoot this out of the way. We're going to wait to put the caps back on or the knobs because, again, you don't want anything to happen to these. Now, let's get down to where the real issue was with the guitar, and that's the tailpiece. Okay, guys, here we go. Now we're going to get to the part that put this guitar in my hands to begin with, and that is this right here this thing had a ornate heavy heavy tailpiece and it's branded it says Gretsch on it you see that and this part is very heavy okay how heavy is this well let's set it to ounces There it is, 5.87. It's not a half a pound, but it's closer to a third. And the issue is, if you look close, this part right here, lining up with that loud motorcycle. Go ahead and find your teenage years at the expense of my recording. That's okay. That part right there, and this part right here are responsible for all this weight hanging out here. Now, I think this was a pretty common problem because I think later models had that one is 3.97, almost 4. So this one's down considerably, not half. But these big replacement monstrosities that you're able to find now they both say Gretsch on them by the way did you see that this one is weighing 6.98 so we still haven't learned these two here the most modern one and the original one are pretty much the same now I found this one on the internet I think it's the right vintage but this part is considerably smaller you see that meaning it weighs less but something went wrong here because somebody just folded this one over now, I don't know if this is an original Gretsch or what but this one is what we're gonna go with and let's move the camera around and I'll show you what we're up to okay guys we got the camera set up here I want you to pay really really close attention to something 
This is a lesson you do not want to learn the hard way. As we peel this tape back, you're going to notice a couple of things. First off, I do not like these things. I do not like them here. I do not like them there. I do not like them anywhere. This is a Dr. Seuss level. I do not like this because this thing, these things tend to come undone and pop out and your guitar crashes to the floor, but we're going to leave it alone. Next thing I want you to notice there is one R. One, two, three. Hey, I made it past second grade. Holes that mysteriously match up with this. One, two, three. But there is a hole right there. You see it? And it has a piece of wire sticking out of it. Do you know what that piece of wire is? You don't want to find out the hard way. This is the wire that comes from the wiring harness inside of there. And it grounds your strings. Now, if you ever find an old K or Harmony or something with pickups on it, and you don't know this, what will happen is you'll start messing around, taking the tailpiece off, thinking you're doing a good job or something, and then this will come out, and you will have a buzz, and people will be like, oh, what's it wrong? My, my, uh, my loud muffler keeps going by. There we go. There we go. $800 exhaust system on a $200 car. Where were we? Anyway, this pops inside and you are not grounding the strings. Here's how this works in case you don't know. This is metal. The strings are metal. I'm going to get a union complaint from Chick Flick Teal Pointer. So when this goes on here, this touches the metal. The Gretsch tailpiece is connected to the strings, connected to the tailbone, connected to the pickup bone, connected to the volume bone. See? That's how you ground them. And this right here is where this broke. Right here, you see this? This spun around like this. Now... I could probably take some JB weld or something like that, but I'm not going to do that. So we're just going to put this in the case along with any screws that we needed to take off here. Now, remember me telling you about the bacon-flavored toothpicks? Remember, your luthier magnet is the best, most trusted way to hold screws you won't lose them that way but bag everything up what do you know rob saved me the original screws that came with the tailpiece now i would paint these chick flick teal if they were new screws but i'm not going to I'm going to use the original screws and I'm going to put the original parts in this bag and it will go in the case with the guitar for eternity. And again, notice that I am putting these screws. I mean, this magnet is picking up everything. There we go. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my Chick Flick Teal. Toothpicks. Because I've already determined that this will not fit here. Guess what? These fit, but this does not fit. You know why? Because they decided we're going to put this here. So I am going to have to take this one out. This looks like it may be a bummer to get out. So I am going to heat it up. I'm going to put some tape around it, mask it off, and then try to work that out because it's going to be necessary to get rid of it and then put this back in. You see that?
Okay, now we have a slight problem. We're going to use two of our bacon flavored toothpaste. You want to taste them to make sure I'm not lying to you because I have way better stuff to go to hell for than that. Remember, that wire right there, protect it with your life. Notice that I put tape all around so we wouldn't be messing up the finish even though it's going to be covered up. But that piece of wire is ever so critical. So we're going to take two pieces of bacon flavored toothpick and we are going to put our rag here. I'm going to put one here like a spud wrench like iron workers. Look at that. That lines up. That's a Gretsch product. But look at what I see here. That does not line up. So what are we going to do? Well, it's obvious to me that we want to plug that, but we're going to plug it with a piece of wood that we can remove if necessary. So how are we going to remove that? Well, the same way we remove this with heat, which means we've heated up our hide glue, and we're going to cut off a piece of this doweling by marking it with the love pencil from the wink can and driving it in there, at which point we will put a different... strap button on one that I can trust and in the event that someone wants to put this back someday it will be yes in that parts bag with all the rest of the stuff and they can just simply take out the screw that I'm going to put in about right there and the different conventional strap button that will ride over the top of that and make the repair. I will put a chick fil teal screw on there because everyone will know Ken has been playing with this. Now let me show you a little trick again. I have that wire right there tied down for its life right there. Thank you Chick Flick Teal Pointer. Now we know that there's been screws in and out of these holes so while our hide glue is heated up we're just going to put a Chick Flick Teal toothpick in there and put some hide glue in those holes that way those screws will cinch up. I won't have to re-drill them. And again, if you heat this stuff up, it will cut loose. Now with the Modern Marvel, that is the bacon flavored toothpick, we're going to get this piece of wire situated where it is going to go and straddle that hole right there and put that one in right there. Now when you're using a screw gun on this stuff you want to make sure that you don't take it all the way in tight and that your clutch is set really low and also that your grounding wire is set where it goes with the rotation of the screw so it doesn't come off and then the last few you want to do by hand. The last thing you want to do is break those off. Now 
we have one to screw here and we are going to put a strap button right there. Always a pilot hole. And again, thanks to Rob, we have the original screws. And we get close so we don't strip them out. And do the rest by hand. And there's our Chick Flick Teal screw going through a standard strap button. Bingo. And then we will put this like so because the last thing we want is this fine finish to be scratched up because that's not something we usually worry about. But there you go. Okay, guys, one more thing with a fancy tool to show you. You see that thing right there? Yeah, your cord plugs into it and who knows how old this one is. I don't like these. I never have. I have nothing but problems with them. That's why I use these pin and jacks, even though I don't use the strap button on them very often. I'll usually put a piece of license plate to beef this up, but we're not going to do that again. Too nice to junk pile. But while you're here, you would get ahead of this using the paper towel wicking method of putting some Marvel Mystery Oil on a paper towel and soaking it like this and then holding it to the threads ahead of time like so and letting that soak in there and getting ahead of it. But then there's a couple of tools that you can use that you're going to find incredible. This one is not as sturdy as the next one I'm going to show you, but what it does is you see it is like a socket right there that brass part fits over the nut and drops on there and then you'll see this rubber piece is tapered here and it has almost what looks like threads on it so you just clip this on here like so and you hold this thumb screw and then you just take this part and you can make sure that that's tight without turning the insides because when this turns wires break off then you got a problem of using dental floss and fishing things through this thing is pretty handy now this one is a little bit beefier of course it's more expensive it comes with two sockets that are a standard size but this fits particular sizes of these nuts that go on an input jack. This one fits this one, as you can see. Now, if I were to turn this and try to tighten it, the whole thing will spin, and again, we have a problem. So this fits inside and clips in like your jack would. You put this in on the part that fits this like a socket, and then you pop that in like so. It grabs ahead of hold of everything and then you just simply hold this and turn this be careful with this you can get a lot of leverage with this but these jack tools are awesome if you work on any guitar that has this configuration you check these every time a guitar comes in every time you handle your guitar I always carry this one in my little bag of tricks here this is stalwart member of this bag of tricks. All right, guys. I like the way this turned out. I got to keep my handy 
special rag around this thing to keep it clean. I'm certainly not used to stuff being in this good a shape. Um, I'm going to put this one back in the collection and see at what point a national will beat up steel rusty Rainer Patisic style national comes up or some beat up Gibson arch top from the late 30s or early 40s but this one is ready to go. I hope that you learned a couple things here about number one keeping a guitar nice, number two um, some things to avoid and number three some fancy tools that will make your job easy especially if you're working on stuff like this. Now I'm going to put this away so I'm not nervous because you know guys like me we can mess up something like this really quickly. I want to give a shout out to Rob at Guitar 48 for sending this one along my way. It just took a little bit of searching to find that tail piece and I like working on this stuff because it makes my skill set increase. So hey, give us a comment below, share your horror stories, talk about some of the better instruments you've worked on and what you've learned about it. Give me a like and a subscribe if you haven't. And I'm going to put this away very carefully because your car is done, your guitar is done, and I'm going to get on something junky next time. See you then.